You can sense God's power in this place, can't you? Reminds me of John chapter 19 and a scene from the Passion of the Christ that we showed here about a week and a half ago. Was anybody here for that? Powerful, right? Just amazingly powerful movie. There's a scene in that movie where Jesus is looking out at the crowd that is chanting, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says to him, who are you? Don't you know I have the power to set you free or to have you condemned? And Jesus looks him right in the eyes. Jesus looks him right in the eyes and says, the only power that you have has been given to you by my Father who is in heaven. Amen? Even at the biggest trial of all time, God the Father was still in control. He's still in control, Journey. The world is going crazy, in case you haven't noticed, but He is still in control. Amen? So i got to get on topic here. So we are on Told You So today. We're going back to our series on Told You So. Not I Told You So. Just told you so. Now, I don't know about you, but when someone says that to me, it's usually sarcastic, right? Or, told you so, man. And I usually missed it, right? I probably should have listened. Perhaps someone I love told me that, and I just didn't listen. But it's always sarcastic. And I'm sure the person that said, told you so, probably feels like I gave you good information, and you just didn't take it. Hello, right? McFly, come on. Oh, some McFly fans in the house. All right, all right. I thought that would go, but okay. But I'm pretty sure that our prophet today, Isaiah, probably felt the exact same way to the nation of Israel, actually the southern tribes. I told you so. I told you so. Here's my prayer today for you. My prayer today for you is that you hear from the Holy Spirit, you don't hear me. Amen? Here's what I know. The Holy Spirit can speak directly to somebody in a service, irrespective of what's being shared up here. I believe the Holy Spirit can share 320 different messages today in here. That's what I believe. If you'll listen to Him, if you'll hear from Him. And I'd love to share this story about Catherine Coleman. That one over your head. Some of y'all, no it did. Amen, sister. Because some of y'all have been in Catherine Coleman services. I know that. Who was Catherine Coleman? An incredible evangelist in the last part of the last century. And for my money, Journey, three of the most predominant evangelists in the last 150 years were all female. Maria Woodworth Etter, Amy Semple McPherson, and Catherine Coleman. And Catherine Coleman preached an awful lot at Carnegie Hall. And Thousands and thousands were saved under her ministry. Thousands were healed. Thousands were delivered and set free. And one night she's walking out, she gets to the stage door, and she grabs the door and she stops. And she says, I have died a thousand deaths grabbing this doorknob. What does she mean by that? She knew that she had to crucify the flesh and get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit move through her. She knew she didn't save a single person. She didn't heal a single person, but the Holy Spirit flowed through her. My prayer today is you hear from the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Well, Joe, are you still with me? Okay. Father, we give you praise. We worship you today. Oh, Lord, our prayer today is, Holy Spirit, that you would come. We just want more of you, oh, God. We want to get out of the way. We want to hear from you. We want to bask in your presence. We want to sing your praises. Lord, we want to dance in your presence, oh God. Father, have your way. Speak to hearts today. Move like only you can move, oh God. And Lord, Lord, be glorified today. Amen? Amen. Amen. So fulfilled prophecy is near and dear to my heart. I shared the last time I was up here. I got saved on a Sunday morning in a fire and brimstone message. That brother was bringing it that day. And I had nothing to do but say yes to Jesus. Or I'd have been dead. I mean, come on, he was bringing it. I said yes to Jesus on a Sunday morning. I walked out of there, a new member in God's kingdom. But I had no idea what that meant. I had never picked up a Bible before. I just signed up for something. I had no clue what I signed up for. I couldn't even spell Hezekiah. I I mean, I didn't know anything, right? 
So I went back on a Wednesday night, the next Wednesday night, adult Bible study. And the teacher said in there that Jesus has fulfilled 320 prophecies. Can you put that slide up? Now, I was going to stand up here and count to 320 just for dramatic effect, but I think you get the point, right? I was pretty good at math in school. In fact, I was real good at math in school. So when that guy said Jesus fulfilled 320 prophecies, I said, wait a second. The mathematical probability is virtually impossible for one man to have fulfilled 320 prophecies. It's one in infinity. Mathematically couldn't happen. I knew that. So let's look at something. Let's look at just eight prophecies. Pastor Mike did this a couple weeks ago. Y'all remember? I'm going to do a little bit differently for you. Put that slide up. Look at that. Here's eight prophecies, right? The time of his birth, he will be born in Bethlehem. He will be born of a virgin. That just cut all you out. <laughs> just that one. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He would be mocked. He would be crucified. He would be pierced. He would die with the wicked, but he would be buried with the rich. There's just eight prophecies. What is the probability, my friends, that one man would fulfill eight prophecies written about his life 400 to 1,200 years prior to he lived? What is that probability? I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. Okay. There it is. Eight prophecies, my friends. One in 28 zeros. And every time you add another prophecy, number nine, it gets exponentially larger. You add number 10, exponentially larger. By the time you get to 320, this room is not big enough to fill all the zeros. What am I telling you? He is who he says he is. There's no doubt. It's mathematically impossible that Jesus is not the Son of God. He is who he says he is. So the question to you now is, what am I going to do with that information? That's the question. It's not, is he King of Kings and Lord of Lords? The answer is, yes, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The answer is, what do I do with that information? And that's the question of the day. And I love the fact that our worship team was in camo today. <laughs> And Pastor Adam was faithful to get up here and talk about a war and a battle, because that's where we're going at the end of our text today. You'll see as soon as we get there. Amazing. I love how the Holy Spirit puts everything together. The other thing I liked about math when I studied math, if you do a mathematical problem, right, one answer. One answer, Journey. And there is just one answer, and his name is Jesus, and that's it. End of story. So we're looking at prophecy recorded today in Isaiah 61. Pastor Adam shared this about two, three weeks ago, Isaiah 61, the first two verses. I'm going to pick it up from there. It's an incredible story. You still with me? Many prophecy has dual fulfillment. What does that mean? It means a prophecy can have, be fulfilled in the short term and in the long term. It also means in a same text of prophecy, there could be a short term prophecy and a long term prophecy. The challenge for you studying prophecy is understanding what period it's prophetic towards. Does that make sense? Today's text is a great example of that. So our prophet today is Isaiah. Now, if I was to ask you who your favorite prophet of Old Testament is, I suspect many of you would say Daniel. Why not? Right? The lion's den. I get it. Right? Some of you charismatics would say Joel. <laughs> right? I get it. Some of you might say Isaiah, but I don't think a great number of you would. So I don't think Isaiah gets the credit that he deserves considering the number of messianic prophecies that are contained in his book. In fact, he is called the messianic prophet and the evangelical prophet. And his name means Yahweh is salvation. Isaiah was a prophet for the southern kingdom, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And for the record, what tribe was Jesus from? That was not a very resounding, confident response. Some of you are like, I don't know. So for those of you that don't know that, we do give Bibles away over there on the counter. No, I'm serious. We have Bibles over there for you. Please take them. Journey Church gives away Bibles. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, same tribe as Isaiah. So before we get to our text today, 
I want to share Isaiah's call in chapter 6, because it is an incredible section of Scripture. Chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah saw the Lord. That puts Isaiah in rare company. There's probably a handful of individuals in scriptures who can say, I saw the Lord. And you got to picture that. <laughs> high and lifted up, and a train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six. It must have been the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. I have no idea how these creatures can see to fly with their faces covered. But I can't wait till we get there to figure it out. And the one called to another said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What a great picture. That's Isaiah's call to ministry. You all are called to ministry, right? Further on in Isaiah in chapter 8, the Lord says, Who will I send? Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. The same question is for you, Journey Church, as a church and individually. The Lord says, Who will I send? Will you say, Here I am, send me? I pray that you do. I know that we do as a church. I know we go on missions. I know we do outreaches. I'm glad we've answered the call. But you know the hour and the day in which we live, right? That's why there's battle fatigues up here, right? The battle is on, and it's not for the faint of heart, and it's not going to get easier, right? That doesn't mean it's not worth it. That doesn't mean he's still not king of kings and lord of lords. That doesn't mean his team still wins, which we're going to find out at the end of our text today. Isaiah answered the call. He was commissioned to give voice to the divine word, to the prophecies of the Messiah. It would not be easy. Isaiah knew he was to condemn his own people. How would you like to do that today in America? Right? He knew he would face opposition and disbelief and ridicule. He would even be canceled. And some of you, when you became believers, had opposition and you were ridiculed by your friends and your family. I know I experienced it. When I got saved at age 19, my entire circle of friends changed. They had to change because they were a bunch of heathens. And I'm sure you faced it as well. We've had a lifetime of family just don't see like we see it. And that's a challenge. That's what Isaiah faced. Here was Isaiah's message to Israel. See if this sounds familiar to you. He was to declare God's displeasure with and judgment upon sin. They were to cease from social injustice. Does that sound familiar? To cease from carnal indulgences. What is America's number one export? It's pornography. (laughs) Stop trusting in the flesh. Stop the hypocritical pretense of religion. He warned of the consequences of sin and warned the people to turn away from disobedience to avert disaster. But perhaps his greatest message was to lay a foundation of hope and promise for the remnant. And God always has a remnant, Journey Church. Even in America today, he has a remnant. It may look like we're going to hell, but there's a remnant of the body of Christ in America today. And you are a part of that remnant and that army. And we will keep marching on. Amen? Today's prophecy is unique. I love this prophecy because it shows the fulfillment. And Jesus actually tells you it has been fulfilled. I think that's a unique set of prophecy. So with that background, I don't know how long that took, but that's the background. You still with me? Okay, all right, just checking. Alex, you there? Yes, sir. All right, bro. So today's prophecy in Isaiah 61, I look at it in three scenes. You okay, sister? Need a drink or anything? You're good, okay. 
Three scenes. Scene one, Isaiah 60. You heard this from Pastor Adam a few weeks ago. <laughs> Pastor Adam's down there laughing at me. You're, you're never going to see me up here again. This is the last time. <laughs> Might not even have a job on Tuesday, I'm not sure. I gotta join Pastor Eric out at the farm. You don't, you don't really, do, do you really farm? Do you like, you don't, okay. So. Yeah, I'm not doing that. That's, that, ain't, that ain't me. Here we go, Isaiah 61. It's good to have fun in the house of the Lord, right? Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And you heard Pastor Adam sharing this a couple weeks ago, right? That's the period we're in now, right? Jesus has come to set you free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. And I'm going to stop right there. The text goes on to talk about the millennial reign of Christ, which I don't have time to get into today. But I encourage you, study the millennial reign of Christ. It is an amazing period, a thousand-year period after the tribulation, where you have a glorified body and where Jesus is king on earth. Where lion and lamb sit together. This is going to be an amazing period. But there are many prophecies about this period or that period that people misinterpret. A lot of misinterpretation as it relates to prophecy. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stop right there. Let's go to the second scene, scene two. So we're gonna fast forward 700 years. 700 years. Luke 4, 14 through 20. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. In the power of the Spirit That's how we need to walk, Journey, in the power of the Spirit. Amen? We can't do it on our own. We're not going to do it on our own. Why even try to do it on our own? But you've got to walk in the power of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. If Jesus walked in the power of the Spirit, shouldn't you walk in the power of the Spirit? Can I get an amen, Alex? Amen. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As was his custom, he went to the synagogue on a Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And a scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found a place where it was written. And Jesus starts reading what we now call Isaiah 61. It wasn't Isaiah 61 then. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. Now in his synagogue, when a teacher sits down, he's about ready to teach. And Jesus is about ready to teach. And the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That is the biggest mic drop moment in the history of mankind, or scroll drop moment, if you will. Jesus just said to the world, I am the Messiah. And the world has never been the same since. And he did it in a little piddly town called Nazareth. He wasn't even in the temple. But he said, I am the Messiah. And everybody in that synagogue that day knew exactly what he just said. And they were ready to crown him king until he wouldn't do a miracle for them. And how quickly they wanted to throw him off the cliff. And Jesus said, not today. You're not dropping me off a cliff today. But he said, I am the Messiah. I am the king. Now, if you go back to Isaiah 61, this is what I want to show you. And I love this aspect of prophecy. You will find that Jesus stopped in the middle of the text. He didn't even wait till the end of the, he didn't get to the period. Right? He stopped in the middle of the text. 
He got to a comma, and he stopped reading. He didn't read this part. He didn't read the day of vengeance. Why did he not read the day of vengeance that day? Because he would not have been able to say, today this has been filled in your midst. Because the day of vengeance speaks to a different period. Speaks to his second coming. Amen? How precise is prophecy? Jesus stopped right when he had to stop and said, today this part has been fulfilled in your sight. The day of vengeance is yet to come. It's coming. I wish it wasn't coming, but it is. The comma in between the year of the Lord and the day of vengeance has stood for 2,000 years. And Pastor Mike talked about this two weeks ago when he talked about the pause in Daniel. This is the period of time where Jesus' blood being shed were to share as a body of Christ, to win the lost. This is that time. This is the opportunity to get saved and say yes to Jesus. Because once the day of vengeance comes, lights out for all time and eternity. This is it. That comma has lasted for 2,000 years. And I'm not going to put a date on the second coming, church. But if you're not paying attention, there's Bibles over there. On the... Amen? The signs of the times, church. The Bible says you can know the season. You can't know the day, nor do I ever want to figure out the day. You'll never hear me say, oh, this is the date, because that's foolish. But the Bible does say you can know the seasons. Amen? Amen. Prophecy is precise. Jesus stopped right then. But the day of vengeance, my friends, is coming. So I have another slide. Let me show you this. Isaiah 61 prophetically covers a 3,000-year period. 3,000 years, church. So part one was Jesus' first coming. Part two is his second coming. And how many books and movies have been written and made about the second coming? And part three of Isaiah 61 is the millennial reign of Christ. I encourage you to read that. That is an incredible period, right? So this prophecy covers a 3,000-year period. So be careful when you study prophecy. Make sure you understand the period that it is assigned to or what is it prophetic towards. Amen? Here's the thing. Jesus fulfilled the first part of that prophecy. What is the percentage he will fulfill the second part? You can say it. I know. It's 100%. Right, right Mary Jo? If he fulfilled the first part, I guarantee you he will fulfill the second part. If he fulfilled 320 prophecies, I guarantee you he's coming back. Guarantee it. Amen? No doubt about it. The, the Jewish people. I love the Jewish people. Thou shalt prosper who loveth the Jew. But they totally missed the Messiah as a nation. And why did they miss him? Because in Jewish culture back then, you studied scripture. You studied the scrolls. Not only did you study them, you, studied them, you memorized them right? They knew every prophecy about the Messiah. Here's what they missed. They didn't realize he was coming back twice. They thought every prophecy in there was pertained to when he comes the first time, that he would come and defeat the Romans, that he would set up Jesus's kingdom in Jerusalem on earth, and that all the nations of the world would come and look to them, that they would prosper, and they would have peace, and they would be victorious. That's not why Jesus came the first time. And because of that, they totally missed it. To this day, the nation of Israel, the percentage of Jewish believers, low single digits. That is heartbreaking to me. That God's chosen people, to this day, deny him, deny that he's the Messiah. Because they misunderstood prophecy. But we should be praying for the nation of Israel, particularly nowadays, particularly what they're going through right now. Amen? And I think many people are just like the nation of Israel. I think many people reject Jesus because he is not what they expected. He is not what they want. He doesn't meet all my needs. 
I can't live just like I want to live and go to church on Sunday and think that's okay, right? Jesus expects transformation. There is sanctification, right? But many people deny him because he's not what they want or expect. Jesus doesn't say, come unto me and you will be abundantly blessed. That's not what he says. In fact, what he says is they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Slide three. Scene number three. So let's fast forward now 2,000 years. Here we're going to see the fate of those who serve the Lord and those who oppose him. An event prophesied 2,700 years ago. You got to let that sink in, church. We're studying a text that was written 2,700 years ago. With 100% guarantee, it's going to come true. Not only that, this is an event, my friends, if you're a believer in here today, you will be a participant in this event. I don't know about you, that gets me excited, right? I would have loved to see the Red Sea parted, but I wasn't there. Or Daniel in the lion's den. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. I would have loved to see that, right? Or Samson with that jawbone, come on. Would have loved to have seen all that, but I'm not going to see it. Unless they play it in heaven someday in a movie theater, I don't know. <laughs> but the second coming of Christ, this is an event that you are going to be a participant. That, if that doesn't get you excited, check your pulse, man. There's something wrong. So let's put this in prophetic context. So what are we talking about with the second coming? This is after the rapture. This is after the Antichrist is revealed. This is after the judgment seat of Christ. This is after the marriage supper of the Lamb. After the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. This is the end of the tribulation period. Seven years of chaos on earth. You do not want to be here. That's the period we're talking about. Isaiah 61. And the day of vengeance of our God. What is that day of vengeance? It is the second coming of Christ. The rest of that text talks about the millennial reign. What a contrast. Comfort, oil of gladness, mantle of praise. So how can a text say a day of vengeance, yet it's those three positive things? Because there's two groups, obviously. The saved and the unsaved, unfortunately. I pray that nobody is on the other side of this battle when we get there. But that's not what Scripture says is going to happen, unfortunately. So the day of vengeance, if Jesus comes to liberate planet Earth, to turn around all the injustice, and to defeat his enemies. Can you put this next slide up, these two verses? Now, I really hesitated when I saw this, reminded myself I put this in there. So for you conspiracy theorists out there, for the record, I put this verse in there weeks ago. Long before I knew tomorrow's the eclipse. Long before I knew there was an eclipse, I swear. Joel 2.31. And the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now, if you're getting your theology from YouTube, please. Read your Bible. This could not be the eclipse tomorrow. This is the day of his vengeance. This is the second coming. It happens after the tribulation period. We are still seven years away at least from this event happening. Okay? Please get off of YouTube. <laughs> There's an entire culture on YouTube. All they do is target ministries. That's their ministry, is to target other ministries. My friends, that's the spirit of Antichrist. That's what that is. They never preach the word of God. They're never uplifting. They just pick ministries and they start attacking them. <laughs> Jesus said he will know you by your love for one another. Right? We need to love one another. We need to love those crazy guys even though they're whacking at us. Right? Please get off of YouTube. I don't have stock in YouTube, so I could care less. Malachi 4.5. 
Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This is the second coming. Now, Revelation chapter 19. And you knew I was going to go to Revelation, right? Uh, what did you expect? Here we go. And I saw the heaven open. And I love to say this. You, you, you need to picture this. Don't just read this. Don't just listen to me. Put yourself in the scene. You're going to be here. Put yourself in the scene. What does this actually look like? Can you imagine the door of heaven is open? And behold, a white horse. And he that sat thereon called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. Now there's another white horse in Revelation, right? Chapter 6, the first seal is broken. And the white horse rides in to make war. And it's the Antichrist. So like Jesus always does, here he replaces the false Christ with the real Christ on a beautiful looking white stallion. Amen? And his eyes are a flame of fire. This speaks of burning judgment. And again, this is at the end of the tribulation when there has already been seven years of incredible judgment. And upon his head are many diadems. Diadems are crowns. This is a different crown here. Not the same crown in chapter 4 and chapter 6 of Revelation that is a victor's crown that you get for winning a contest. This is a crown that had a white and blue sort of went around the turban of the, the kings in Persia. This was their kingly crown. So Jesus is coming not only as victor, but he's coming back as king. And he hath a name which no one knows but he himself. There are almost a thousand names for the Lord in Scripture. And yet here's a name that you haven't even heard yet. He's already described a thousand different ways in the Word of God. A thousand names that describe his attributes and his character. And here's a name we don't even know yet. A number of years in the man cave, there was a young man in there who shared a vision the Lord had given him. And he told him the Lord showed him that the Lord could receive a new name that describes his love or attributes or character. A new name every single day for all time and eternity. And it would still not adequately describe our God. That blew me away. We can't understand the glory, the majesty of our God in our finite minds. We just can't. And he is arrayed in a garment sprinkled with blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and pure. I sure hope you can ride a horse, friend. If not, Pastor Eric can give you lessons. Amen? Do you ride horses? No, he don't forget. He will this day. There might be a crash course in glory about horse riding. I'm not sure. And out of his mouth proceedeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth upon the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God the Almighty. And he hath on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, that is amazing to read as a believer because we are going to be victorious. But the flip side is there's an army on the other side that has rejected the Messiah. And if you know your scripture in Revelation, at some point they actually curse God. After all the judgments, and he just wants to draw them to himself, they actually curse God. This is not an army that will ever turn to the Lord. This is not an army that's going to say yes to Jesus, unfortunately. So who is this? Where is this blood? He is arrayed with a garment sprinkled with blood. Is that his blood? No. Nah. His blood was shed 2,000 years ago. It's already been shed for you. His blood washes away your sins. That is finished. He said on the cross, it is finished. This is not his blood. In fact, we see in Isaiah 63 where this blood may have come from. 
Scripture always matches Scripture. It always confirms Scripture. In fact, I didn't go over it, but many of the names for Jesus that we just read appear elsewhere in the book of Revelation. I encourage you to study the book of Revelation. It is amazing. Isaiah 63, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the peoples there was no man with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their life blood is sprinkled upon my garments. And I have stained all the raiment, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. So the blood is not his. So those pictures of Jesus being some effeminate little nice character, forget that. He's coming back as a warrior, as a conqueror to the arm, against the armies of Satan who stand to oppose him. The armies of Satan who day in and day out attack you. Day in and day out want to take you down. Make no mistake, I love the battle fatigues. This is a battle. We are in a battle. So let's return to the second coming. You still with me? Yes. All right. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse and against his army. They gather to make war against the king of kings and the lord of lords. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that were cast alive in a lake of fire that burneth with brimstone. If you don't think hell is a real place, my friend, I got bad news for you. Hell is a real place. And the rest were killed with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, even the sword which came forth out of his mouth. There are only two armies here. This isn't a vast array of a battlefield. There's two armies. Scripture tells us elsewhere that this army has 200 million warriors gathered against Israel. That's why they have come to fight the nation of Israel. Right? 200 million warriors with every armament you can think of. Tanks, cruise missiles, nuclear weapons, aircraft carriers, aircraft, you name it. This army is well armed. 200 million ready to destroy Israel. Let me ask you a question. In today's geopolitical environment, can you see a scenario where the world would gather against the little nation of Israel? I do. <laughs> there are many nations today poised to attack them. They just need to bring in a few more troops. I see the seeds of it coming already. 200 million soldiers, every armament, and Jesus is coming back on what? A white horse. And you're on a white horse, but you don't have a weapon. Or you don't have a gun. You have nothing. This is the biggest mismatch in the history of mankind. Of all wars that have ever been fought, this is the biggest mismatch ever. Right? <laughs> but God. Because <laughs> Jesus comes back with the word of God. Did you catch that? The word, with his word, he destroys the army of 200 million people. You didn't lift a finger. You didn't pull a trigger. You didn't do anything. He just said, boom, and it's done. How powerful is the Word of God? How powerful is the Word of God? If you're not picking up your Bible every single day, pick up the weapon, please. The power is in your hands. With His Word, He just wipes them out. I don't know what He says that day. I hope I'm close enough to hear. Because I can't, I can't wait to hear what He says. He wipes an entire 200 million army out with just His Word, friends. And again, you don't even have a weapon. Let me ask you a question. If at the biggest battle of all time, the biggest battle that has brewing, been brewing from the beginning of creation, from the Garden of Eden, this battle has been, this has been brewing. If this is the biggest battle of all time, and you're in the battle, and you're on a horse, but you don't have a weapon because you don't need one, he's going to fight that battle for you, don't you think he'll fight your daily battles too? Right? Let him 
fight your battles. Get out of the way and give it to him and let him be king and Lord of your life. Let him fight your battles. I could talk about the second coming all day, but I don't have time. Here's a key event that happens at the end of the tribulation. And this is not often talked about, but I love this. At the end of the tribulation, the nation of Israel will finally say yes to Jesus as their Messiah. Zechariah 12, 8 through 10. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God. Let the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. Praise God. This nation, after 2,000 years, will finally say yes to the Messiah as their king and Lord. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. My friends, there's a battle coming. There's a war coming. And when we get to this point in the story, you're either on one side or the other side. And if you're in here today, like I was many years ago, and I walked into church not knowing who Jesus was, but that day became clear to me, maybe there is a Son of God. Maybe, just maybe, He is the Messiah. And if you're in here that day, or today, and you don't know Him, I'm going to strongly encourage you, today can be the day. Today is your day. Say yes to Jesus. Give your life to him. Let him fight your battles. Here's what I found out 40 years ago. When he comes in, everything just got better. My life didn't get better. My perception, my reality got better. I was in his hands and his arms, and everything seemed so much clearer. Would you bow your heads with me? Friend, I've got to ask you, because the Word of God is powerful, and the Spirit of God is true. And if you are in here today and you don't know Jesus, or you don't even know if you don't know Jesus, today can be your day. Today can change the rest of your life. If that's you, and you want to say yes to Jesus today, I want to know who I'm praying for. Would you slip up your hand real quick?